I'm Mark Golub, and in the news is a disturbing report concerning a formal meeting of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, to mark the launch of two German-funded UN projects to take place in southern Lebanon to improve Lebanon's water supply network and to rehabilitate shelters in the Rashidia camp. And what was so disturbing about this United Nations project was that at this official UN launch event, a map was displayed by the United Nations Agency, a map of the Middle East, which was missing the state of Israel. Rather, the UN map simply showed Palestine with the Palestinian flag and the inscription Arab Palestine. Well, to comment on the significance of this United Nations map, we're very pleased to have on our phones from Efrat Israel right now, a man who's done amazing work in monitoring the way in which the Palestinian community and the world is portraying the Jewish state of Israel, the founder and director of an organization called Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus. Itamar, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, pleasure to be with you. So, Itamar, you picked the story up. Lo and behold, at this uh, German event, the UN event in Germany, what was so surprising and upsetting to you about the map the United Nations used? Well, the, um, this map, which presents the Middle East with only Palestine and no Israel, is the standard Palestinian Authority map. It appears in the offices all the ministers of government, it appears uh, Mahmoud Abbas has held one up for the cameras to take a picture of him. It is the map of the Palestinian Authority. It's the only official map that they have. And it, it presents a Palestine and it presents no Israel. Every part of Israel is incorporated. What was surprising here is that this was a, an UNRWA event, um, and the UNRWA representative apparently was presented with this map as a present, and instead of not accepting it, she actually picked it up and posed for the pictures with it. The problem with the map is it not only shows all of uh, what they call Palestine, it shows Jordan next to it, it shows Egypt, and it has it right in the names of all the countries. Of the, uh, it shows Syria with the name, but it doesn't show Israel. And that's the problem because the Palestinian Authority presents to their people the world that Israel makes the children believe that justice will only happen when there is Palestine and there is no Israel. And the CVUN, UNRWA, who's involved with refugee work, uh, accepting this kind of a map as legitimate, of course, uh, reinforces this and just pushes peace or any possibility of peace uh, further off into the distance. Yes. You know, it's interesting, Itamar. I think we understand that from the Palestinian Authority perspective, they would like to suggest that Israel is somehow illegitimate. As long as it's illegitimate, on their own map, they would not portray the state of Israel. I'm always a little bit surprised that American Jews don't understand that this is the Palestinian perspective. Israel is illegitimate. What bothered me, and I hear you're saying the same thing, what bothered me is the United Nations, which does include Israel as a formal member state, the United Nations was party to in some way endorsing that Palestinian map. And I'm curious from your perspective, is this unusual for the UN to do? Does it surprise you from that perspective? Well, let me give you uh, another example about a different organization, uh, International Red Cross. And this is a report that Palestinian Media Watch just released uh, a couple of days ago. Um, just to show you how common this is with international organizations, International Red Cross participated in a, in a Palestinian tree planting um, uh, tree planting event, um, which was honoring the 150th anniversary of the International Red Cross. They planted 150 trees together with the Palestinian Red Crescent. But get this, the trees were all named. Each one of them was named after a different, what they called veteran prisoner, which means prisoners who have been in jail for probably over 20, sometimes 30 years, which means in almost all cases you're talking about murderers. Mm -hmm. So the International Red Cross this week participated in a tree planting event honoring 150 terrorist murderers. This, this is the jail. International Red Cross? International Red Cross, exactly. 
So you see, in the same week, you've got an UNRWA event, uh, you've got an International Red Cross event, um, and they're going along with Palestinian ideology. They're participating in these events, giving sponsorship. The, the International Red Cross had no reason to, to, to honor terrorists. Just because the Palestinian Authority does, they were invited to celebrate this way. They should have said, sorry, we don't participate in honoring terrorists. The same way that UNRWA should have said, uh, the, the unrepresentative in seeing that map say, I'm sorry, I don't accept a map like that because there is no Israel on that map. Mm -hmm. The UN, the International Red Cross, all these international organizations who present themselves as promoting peace by going along with all of the Palestinian Authority terror promotion and hate promotion are have become a major part of the problem. Mm -hmm. They're giving legitimacy when the Palestinians see that international organizations accept this, they conclude that it's actually fine, it's actually okay. Itamar, how long have you been doing this work? I've been doing this since 1996. Since 1996. And I ask you because from your perspective as you have an overview here, has it gotten worse of late or is this simply the status quo that you've experienced for what, 20 years? It's uh, I would say it's definitely gotten worse of late. Um, there were the, basically there are periods, and each period has its own problems. During the period of what they Palestinians call Intifada, what we call the the terror campaign, during the terror campaign from 2000 to 2005, there were explicit and continuous calls from the official Palestinian Authority structures for the killing of Jews. Uh, not only killing of Jews, killing of the Jews was viewed was presented as mandatory in the name of Islam. Uh, terror, every terrorist who killed was, was presented as a, as, a, as a glorious hero, and uh, was, was given. And, and suicide bombers were all called shaheed, which means holy Islamic martyr, uh, which could not be, which is only describing some of it as a positive action. So, during that period of 2000-2005, you had incessant terror terror glorification, incessant promotion of killing Jews. Today, because of international pressure, they can't say those things openly. So what do they do? There has been a tremendous increase in the glorification of terrorists, honoring of terrorists, like this tree planting ceremony that the International Red Cross participated in. As far as we're concerned, glorifying terrorists who've killed civilians is just as bad, maybe even worse, than having a speech that says, kill the Jews. Because if someone gives a speech and says, kill the Jews, someone could listen and say, well, they don't really mean it. It's an exaggeration, but when someone has murdered civilians and the Palestinian Authority says, this person is your hero and role model, it is the greatest promotion of terror, this is something that doesn't stop now in the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. We get numerous examples every single week of terror glorification in the Palestinian Authority. So in that sense, today the situation is much, much worse. There's another reason why it's worse. The international community stopped complaining to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, in the past, when they would glorify terrorists, there would be complaints, there would be letters written by congressmen, senators. Today, people have so few expectations of the Palestinian Authority that they basically accept and go along with all their hatred and all of their terror promotion. Mm -hmm. And the Palestinians interpret this, okay, everybody accepts the premises that it's fine. Itamar, I want you to answer some of the criticism of the position you've just articulated, I'd love to hear what you would answer. There are people who point out that whether one is a terrorist or, quote, a freedom fighter, depends on which side of the fence you're on. And w w the other guy sees the, the terrorist, but from one's own perspective, it is a freedom fighter. And there are those who would argue that those who are assaulting individual Israelis are no different than the Israeli army that sometimes uses planes and, and bombs and uh, napalm to basically destroy Palestinians whom Israel feels at a given point in time need a reprisal. And that what you really have is a very well-equipped mechanized army fighting an army of individuals who, yes, may even sacrifice their own lives by strapping a bomb on their body, 
but that from a Palestinian perspective, these people are their heroes. And that the Israeli and the Jew has to understand that a, you know, a warrior is a warrior. And therefore, it is unfair for the Jew to act as if the, quote, terrorist is somehow less of a noble, moral warrior than an IDF soldier. That's an argument you hear all the time. Itamar, what's your answer? Well, there, there, if, there were legitimate, if there was a conflict going on, that is to say, if there, when there's a conflict, let's say, uh, in Gaza, and, and Israel is forced to bring its soldiers in, uh, Palestinian combatants who fight against Israeli soldiers during that kind of a conflict, um, it's legitimate. Uh, even though it's, uh, you know, e even though Israel didn't initiate it, and Israel was forced to do this, that is somehow accepted as legitimate. And I'll accept that as legitimate. There's, uh, there's a war going on. Soldiers are coming from our side, and and, and even though we're fighting terrorists, there, there's a conflict going on. But if during that terror campaign, because they can't defeat the Israeli soldiers, they shoot and target their missiles at civilians, that is totally not acceptable. What we're talking about now are not terrorists who fought against Israeli soldiers. We're talking about terrorists, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, a terrorist named Issa Abed Rabo has been in jail now since the 1980s. Why is he in jail? Because he found two Israeli university students who were hiking south of Jerusalem. He forced them to lie down. He tied them up with ropes. This whole time they're begging for their lives. Um, and then he puts, he covers up their heads and he shoots bullets into the heads and murders them both. This is Isa Abed Rabo. He's been in jail since then, serving two life sentences. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, the head of Fatah, the mod, so-called so moderate, sent the, uh, the, the person who runs his office as his representative to go to the family of uh, Isa Abed Rabo to speak to his mother, uh, to say how much she's hoping that he's free. He even said that our sons who are in prison, I can't remember the exact wording now, are the, are the greatest of the, uh, of the Palestinian sons. Why is Mahmoud Abbas glorifying a person who blew the brains out of two, two young, young teenagers or two teenagers who were just hiking uh, south of Jerusalem? That is pure terror. That is pure, uh, and that is outrageous terror glorification. If Mahmoud Abbas thinks these people are heroes, then Mahmoud Abbas is not a peace partner. Israel, and he's bringing up a generation of Palestinians who will not be peace partners with Israel. You say it beautifully, Itamar. I appreciate it. Incidentally, coming back for one moment to the actual map, how in the world does a United Nations agency legitimize, justify the fact that they're using a map without a member state of the United Nations on it, even though that state exists. Have you ever heard the United Nations address this issue? The United Nations, uh, not specifically the United Nations, but what we've heard from other diplomats is that the Palestinian Authority, who is, were very sharp with preparing answers for every single violation that they do, um, the Palestinian Authority has said that because there are no final borders. They will continue to use the map of Palestine that existed under the British. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. They don't present it that way to their children. They present it as a Palestinian uh, Arab map. They don't present it as a British map. They don't show the British flag on there. They show the Palestinian flag on there, and they call it Arab Palestine. Yes. So, but that is their excuse. And I have heard intelligent people in the diplomatic corps saying things like, well, Palestinians say you don't have a final border, so let's not discuss maps. It's outrageous. It's giving excuses for them, bringing up a generation who anticipates and believes that eventually they will destroy Israel. And that is the general feeling in the Palestinian Authority today. Uh, and that's what we have to deal with. Itamar, you have done work also dealing with the way in which Israel is portrayed in Palestinian textbooks. And I know yeah. you've done that for the State of Israel. You've worked on a joint committee with Hillary Clinton. In general, I hear two things going on at the same time. I hear some people telling me that the textbooks are as bad as they've ever been. 
I've heard other people say, oh no, the Palestinians have revised their textbooks. Would you clarify this for us, Itamar? To what extent are Palestinian textbooks still portraying Jews as in, in horrific ways? To what extent do you feel the situation in textbooks within the Palestinian Authority that the situation is better than it used to be? The, the Palestinian textbooks have gone through a certain change. The, when we started studying the textbooks the first time, which was in 1999, the Palestinians at, the, at that time were still using Jordanian textbooks. Now, those textbooks completely denied Israel's right to exist, uh, but also had tremendous anti-Semitism, yes. tremendous demonization of Jews as well. Now, when the world put pressure on the Palestinians to do their own school books and, and get rid of the Jordanian school books, they took out the anti-Semitism, but they left in the delegitimization of Israel. So the maps still don't show Israel. Uh, occasionally they'll put in the borders of uh, Judea and Samaria, but they won't mark it as Israel. They'll call it, they'll mark it as different regions within Palestine. This will be the, the liberated region. This will be the occupied region. Um, they present occupation in the school books, not as 67. Uh, they present it as 1948. They define Israel as a foreign colonial racist implant uh, in the Middle East. We have no right to exist because we're foreign and we're colonial. Um, they even go so far as to say, um, anyone who's everyone, everyone who's fighting foreign colonial racist regimes has the right to use any means. So they're actually justifying the use of arms and terrorism against Israel. All of this is in the are in the current uh, Palestinian school books. So are they better or worse? As far as Israel goes, they're as bad as they've ever been. As far as Judaism and Jews goes, uh, there's no legitimization of Judaism. Nothing positive about Judaism, but they've taken out the hatred. And what about By the way, this? Is different than let me explain. This is different than the Israeli school books. Israeli school books not only have nothing negative about Islam and Muhammad, but they all learn about Islam and Muhammad. Children learn about about Islam as as one of the three major um, uh, monotheistic religions, and, and nothing negative at all is presented about it. So um, it's presented even positively. So it's, in, in Judaism, they took out the hatred, but it's still as if it doesn't exist. And what about your review and your analysis of what Palestinians see on Palestinian television? And again, memory tells us, the organization in Washington that monitors what's going on in the Arab language and the Arab world, memory seems to suggest that there are still horrific things being said about Jews on Palestinian television. What's your own experience? Well, this is what, I mean, we're the ones who are doing all the work on Palestinian TV. Um, and we follow all of Palestinian TV. And if you, if you watch, if you look at some of the things we've recently uh, released, I mean, for example, just a few weeks ago, uh, we released a uh, children's program on official Palestinian television where you had a very young girl, uh, and uh, she... She was reciting a poem which she actually had learned by heart. And the poem in included the words, uh, the Jews are the enemies of Allah, the descendants of pigs. They, they, they chopped off our arms and legs like snakes. They raped the women in the, um, in the, publicly in the squares. All of this, said from a child who's probably so young, she probably didn't even know what the word rape meant. Um, and, and this is on official Palestinian TV. Another time on the same children's program, the, a different girl said, uh, the Jews are Satan with a tail. A few weeks later, uh, a different girl on a different program said the Jews are Satan with a tail. So what we're getting is incessant demonization. Uh, this on the children's level. Then you, on the adult level, you'll have things like the, uh, the, um, the deputy minister of prisoners saying things like, um, Israel has to remember that we're in the uh, 21st century, and the prisons can't keep the prisons, which are so bad, they're worse than the Auschwitzes of the Nazis. Okay. Worse than the Auschwitzes. That's how the Palestinian prisons, he, he claims, are. Um, which, of course, is, is, is absolutely a total, total libel. The, the prisons are absolutely, some people call them actually country clubs. Uh, the conditions are so good for Palestinian prisoners. 
but this kind of libel. So you have incessant demonization. The problem isn't the TV. The problem is the leadership. This is a minister saying this. Um, we had a mayor of a city saying that Israel, uh, also recently, Israel makes ammunition in the shapes of um, toys and pencils. That children will find the ammunition on the ground that didn't explode and will pick it up and will be killed. And he said this proves that Israel is targeting Palestinian children. Again, a total, total lie. Israel treats thousands of Palestinian children every year in its hospitals. And here you have a mayor on TV saying Israel is targeting Palestinian children and making, making munitions that look like toys. So the, the problem isn't the TV. The problem is the leadership who wants its people to hate Israelis, wants its people to hate Jews. They demonize, uh, deny a right to exist. And a generation is growing up in the Palestinian Authority filled, filled with hatred for this demonic people that they've been presented with these demonic Jews and this demonic Israel state. Itamar, as I hear you describe the situation on the ground, in the textbooks, on Palestinian television, it's hard to find reason for hope without being, you know, sort of like a romantic, naive child. And, you know, the Jew always says, we will continue to hope, we'll continue to strive for peace, we'll try to encourage those within the Palestinian community who want peace to be more and more secure, to be more and more vocal, and to be more and more visible. But as I hear you describe the situation, Itamar, from a realistic perspective, is there any reason to hope that there will be a change in the relationship between the Palestinian community and the Jewish community of Israel in the near future? Certainly no reason believe there'll be a change, uh, the, the demonization that the Palestinians' leadership has given its people has nothing to do with territory. The, the myth that if Israel were to run away from land, that it, uh, that it certainly has as much right to as anyone else. But uh, theoretically, if Israel were to run away from it in the interest of peace, there's nothing that would... A child who learns that Israel is the enemy of Allah and descendant of a pig... That stigma does not go away if the borders change. If Israel is Satan, that doesn't go away when the borders change. And that's the key to the Palestinian Authority demonization. They're demonizing not Israel's policies, but the essence of Jews and the essence of what we are. And that'll never go away, and that'll never change. And that's why there's absolutely zero reason for hope there'll be any change in, this, in the near future. The only reason for hope is that we have been doing a lot of work with foreign countries that fund the Palestinian Authority, uh, in Norway now, there's some kind of a, almost a governmental crisis going on there because of the way they've been funding blindly the Palestinian Authority. Britain has similar things happening. Um, in, in, in Denmark, there's been a debate in Parliament. Um, we're hoping that eventually enough governments who fund the Palestinian Authority will realize where their money is going, will insist that the Palestinian Authority change their ways um, or not get any money. The Palestinian Authority needs money. Uh, and presumably, hopefully, will decide to, to change. Uh, and so there, there's the only hope for peace there. The Palestinian mm -hmm. Authority can't keep their promotion of hatred without the influx of funds from around the world. And we're hoping that once the world uh, and enough leaders find out about this and decide to take a stand on this, I think they'd be able to force a change. Now, once there will be a change, it will be years before all of this hatred and demonization erased from the Palestinian psyche before Palestinian children learn that Israelis have been actually great neighbors to them. It will be many years. But that is the first step we're waiting for. Uh, and based on our successes in Europe uh, and the United States, Canada, Australia, um, there is a slight reason for hope, but we're talking about a very, very long way down the line. Yes. But we talk for just 30 seconds on one side point here. To what extent do you think the American administration understands the dynamic you've described for us. To what extent are they sensitive to it and realize that it is an obstacle that has to be overcome, much more than the issue of settlements? But take 30 seconds, and where do you see the U.S. administration understanding it? To what extent does the U.S. understand what you've just said? There are many members of Congress who understand. I've spoken to many members of Congress just a few weeks ago. There was a delegation of members of Congress here, including 
um, the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee at Royce, the ranking Democrat uh, at Engels, uh, Anita Lowy from the Appropriations Committee. They all heard my presentation. They all understood it. Um, there's legislation underway now that's been written by Engels and Royce, which incorporates a lot of how, in fact, the entire legislation is, is, is basically based on Palestinian Media Watch findings, which would prevent the funding of the Palestinian Authority um, if they don't uh, change basically all of their hate promotion on every different level and start promoting peace. If that legislation passes Congress, um, it will have a monumental effect on the chances for peace because the Palestinian Authority would have to decide, do you want the hundreds of millions of dollars a year from American money, or will you start teaching peace? And if they're presented with that choice, and if they're presented with that choice, around the world, they won't have any choice but to change their ways, erase the hatred, stop promoting peace. So um, the American Congress is aware. I don't know if the administration is aware. To the same extent, we're hoping that Congress and Senate can create the legislation and bring the administration along. Edouard Marcus, I love talking to you. I appreciate enormously the work you do with Palestinian Media Watch. I wish you kol tuv haslacha, and whenever we're near each other, we'll sit face to face. Thank you, and uh, from strength to strength, Itamar, you keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. Be well. The thoughts of Itamar Marcus, who again is the founder and director of Palestinian Media Watch. As always, I'd love to have any reactions you have to the ideas expressed by Itamar Marcus. Please be in touch with me this week. Write me. Email me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.